Thanks for the chance to speak. What I'd like to talk about is some work we did in Cole Scrivener's in the front row here. He's another partner in crime in this, this project as well, so this is good. I've got two outs. Um, it was a project that came about in 2012 when we realised that there was a lot of worm control information for merino sheep, sheep and wool production. Um, we could give some good advice, we knew the effects of worms on merino ewes and, and lambs and in merino systems, but as the shift to prime lamb production increased, there, were more un there was a lot more uncertainty. We'd do a lot of egg counting for farmers in the lab and you'd get results and you well, what do you do, what do you... Is it important to drench prime lamb ewes, is it important to drench prime lambs? So in 2012, MLA made a significant investment in a program called Lifting the Limits. And the aim of that project was to, over three years, develop um, some optimal economic and sustainable worm control advice for prime lamb systems. So it's easy to control worms, you just keep drenching them every month. How long that lasts for, we don't know, and it's usually not very long, and it's very expensive. So it needs to be sustainable over the long term, and it also needs to be economic within the system. What, what do we need to do? So they established this national project. It was led by the University of New England in, in Armidale and they had a core of farms in the Northern Tablelands. Um, we had some other farms in the Central Tablelands. Um, we managed a group, it was originally planned as four farms, but the project sort of grew a bit out of that and was a bit more difficult to manage, but a core of farms in the, in the southwestern New South Wales and then also the McKinnon project managed a, a group of farms in Victoria. So different systems, different environments, different climates, looking at what advice was possible. And the aim was to come up with a, an LTL or a lifting the limits or a best practice recommendation um, for prime lamb ewes and prime lambs and compare that with typical practice. So compare that with what farmers were doing on their own in the different regions see if it could be improved, see if there's any difference on, and come up at the end with the best advice for farmers. What happened in, in our region, and I'll talk about it a bit more as we go along, is that the typical practice is what, what the farmers were doing originally is probably not too much different from the lifting the limits or the best practice. Um, at the start of it we weren't quite sure what lifting the limits or best practice was and we probably planned for, for over drenching, um, but in the end the two systems or the two approaches came out relatively similar. There's a paper in your proceeding, I'll just mention this quickly, there's a lot of detail, there's 20 or 30 pages there of, of data. Bruce has just finished the stats on this project and there's about 80 pages of stats as well, so we're not going to go through all that today. Um, the information's there if you want and you can contact us for more. What I've done today is just pulled out some of the key bits and pieces to um, start to formulate some simple recommendations. So trial design, basically we, we started with use and two trial mobs of ewes on each farm. They were scanned in twin, so the whole two lots of, of 120 in a mob, so 120 trial ewes in one mob on a farm and 120 trial ewes in another mob on a farm. All of the trial ewes were scanned in twin at the start of the trial so that we had some relative uniformity there. In each mob, 60 of those ewes were kept worm free, so they were treated regularly with, with drenches or antimintics long acting products to keep worms to virtually zero in those sheep. It's not something that we'd advocate um, and by doing that on the farms we actually saw the effects that it has. You tend to get resistance really quickly um, but it gives us a baseline that we'll talk about in a minute. The other 60 ewes, so the other 60 trial ewes got either the, the lifting the limits, the best practice advice or the typical treatments on that farm <coughs> and then we compared those two groups. They were weighed about every two months so we started after scanning, as soon as we knew they were twinners, we set up the two trial groups after scanning and then went through, did some other weights, condition scores and egg counts, pre-lambing, lamb marking, through to weaning, then again pre-joining and then followed them through to scanning the year after so that we could see if there was any residual effects of the worm control on the, um, the lambing performance in the following year. So they basically ran for a, a year um, as their trial treatments. And we also recorded lambing percentage and, and scanning data and some of that is in, in the paper in the, in the, the proceedings. <coughs> so these are our ewes, or some of the ewes. Mixture, we ended up with about nine farms involved in the project in, in southwestern New South Wales. 2012 to 2014, the best way to get rid of worms is to set up a worm trial. 
as soon as you'd start to set up an experiment to try to measure the effects of worms, um, most of the worms seem to disappear on the farm. So if you want some advice, that, that would be my best advice. They were also very good years, so three very good seasons. So our U condition score averaged 4.2 at times during the trial, and probably the lowest it ever got to was about 3.2. So U's in very good condition, good nutrition, good seasons, um, and also a reasonably moderate worm challenge rather than a heavy worm challenge. So we need to keep that in mind with our recommendations. What do we do with the U's? Basically, the SUP U's or the, the worm free U's are our baseline. Right, by removing worms from those, they give us an indication of what production is possible from the ewes on that farm in that year with that nutrition, with that genetics. Right? So they're our baseline. We compare those to either our best practice treated ewes or our typical ewes and that gives us the difference. Right? That difference is the effect of worms. Everything else is the same. That difference by comparing our worm free sheep to the sheep that we've imposed treatments on tells us the difference in production or the effect, the effect of worms. And as I said, in New South Wales, our typical effect was eventually similar to LTL. We'll talk about that in a minute. So the lamb, so that was the ewes. So we set up two groups of ewes, worm, one half worm free, the other half treated on, on those nine farms over the four years. The other thing we did was identify the lambs from those ewes, so from those different groups of ewes. Um, and we followed those through. We knew what lambs came from the worm free ewes, we knew what lambs came from the other ewes and then we split after marking half of each of those lambs and kept them worm free. So at marking time we counted the number of lambs from each various treatment of ewes, we pulled out some more lambs, we tagged those and then half of those lambs were kept worm free by drenching, basically drenching every month through to weaning time from marking to weaning. The other half we didn't treat at all and then we measured the weights and, and condition scores and the egg counts on those. So that was to look at was there an effect on the lambs from the different ewe treatments and then also what should we be doing with lambs. So we've got lambs to marking time, we get them through to weaning time and first sale, what should we be doing with regards to worms during that time. And so they went through to sale which was typically about 8 to 10 weeks after marking time. And this is how we did it. So these it might be a little bit difficult to see, these are ewes we basically utter painted the ewes depending on what treatment they had and then when the lambs went and had a drink we could tell whether they'd come from a worm free ewe or from a, from a typical or, a, or an LTL ewe. Um, it, was, it looks nice and clean on that slide, I've still got overalls um, that the students ask me why have I been painting and things like that in them um, with red and blue and oil. Well there's some more lambs, it's a bit difficult to see but these guys have got blue heads here and you can see a tinge of red on these, so when we come back a, a couple of weeks later we can divide them up. So some results. This is sort of like the overall summary, so this looks at, at years 1, 2 and 3 and compares on our farms, our LTL farm and typical farms, the difference between worm free ewes, this is ewes, worm free ewes and our treatment ewes, so either our LTL ewes on this property or our typically treated ewes here. And you can see over lambing and even over the whole year, from the initial weight to the last weight, that there really wasn't much difference, right? Over, for example, this place here, over lambing in year one, our LTL farm, there was only a two kilo live weight difference between worm free ewes and ewes that just received LTL treatment, so pre lambing drench and maybe one other drench over lambing time, and there was only about a three kilo difference over the whole 12 months. So again, it showed us that ewes that were in really good condition good nutrition, a relatively moderate worm challenge, right, the egg counts on a few farms got up to five to six hundred eggs per gram which is about that level where we'd start to, to think a bit more about them but typically they're around two, three, four hundred eggs per gram. Good condition ewes, good nutrition in front of them, there's really not much difference between keeping the worm, the ewes, totally worm free and just giving the ewes an occasional drench during the year. So that's one of the messages that we'll come back to um, at the end. This was one of the, the most interesting farms. This was um, a farm that in year one we had our suppressed, we had our worm free group, which was almost worm free, our lifting the limits group, but then we also included a group of ewes that never got a drench for the 12 months, right? So a nil treatment. This was either brave, brave or foolhardy. It was brave 
we were lucky. It wasn't too bad a year. And you can see the green bars are the group of ewes that didn't get a drench. So they didn't get a drench for the whole time that we made the measurements. They started off less than 50 eggs per gram in, in May 2012. The egg count's up to about 150 through here. Got to a peak of about 350 over summer and then came back to about 300. So even though they didn't get a drench for that whole year, the egg counts um, still were not very, very high, not relatively high. We wouldn't start to worry about those until probably five or six hundred eggs per gram. But the effect of that was this. So we had our worm-free group lost 2.7 kilos over the 12 months. Our lifting the limits group, so they got a, a pre lambing drench and maybe one other drench lost five. The group of ewes that didn't get a drench over that 12 month period lost 12 kilos. So a significantly greater um, weight loss over that 12 months in that group. When you pull that apart, this is the weight loss over the different groups, over the different time frames, so different groups again over the different time frames. You can see that the, the most significant weight loss is around that lambing through to early lactation period. And so this is the risk time. This is the risk time if we do nothing, if we don't drench prime lamb ewes at all over 12 months, even though they're in good condition and not under a lot of worm pressure, then we can get some, some issues here, which translates into weight loss of the ewes over 12 months. And then when we look at this, these are the groups of lambs. So this year one figure is the groups of lambs from those three different groups of ewes. Right? So these are the lambs, the average weight of the lambs at marking from the worm free ewes was 13.9, from the lifting the limits group was 13.4, the lambs from that untreated group of ewes averaged 10.7. So significantly lighter <coughs> at marking time and so that's a potential risk. The other thing that happened though is you can see they caught up to the others, they actually gained more than the others um, by the time they got through to weaning. So by the time they got through to first draft and sale, they'd started off three kilos lighter but had caught up to the rest and so had put that weight back on. That's doable if the nutrition is good. So if the ewes are in good condition and the nutrition is good, then it probably minimises this risk. What we don't know is what happens if the condition is bad or the season is tight. <coughs> right. I've just put up there, there's, this is the same group of ewes um, two years later. Similar approach, we had a nil group again and you can see the lambs were similar in weight to the others. In that year, the ewes, the nil ewes only lost an extra three kilos compared to the rest. So they didn't have that big weight gain and so the lambs were very similar at marking time. So we wouldn't recommend not drenching ewes um, <coughs> because of the risk to the live weight of the ewes plus also the potential risk to the lambs but you can probably make that up if the season is right. We'll, we'll summarise that at the end. There we go. Right, lambs. What else did we see in the lambs? The other thing that we compared in lambs was what was the performance of groups of lambs that didn't get a drench, so didn't get a drench between marking and weaning or first draft and sailing, what um, was their performance compared to the ones that got monthly treatments during that time. So we kept them basically worm free as well. And you can see, and these, these numbers are in your proceedings, that in, in 10 of those 17 mobs there was less than half a kilo difference. So lambs at marking through to weaning, through to first draft and sale. We've got some that were drenched every month. We've got some that weren't drenched at all. And there was less than half a kilo difference when those lambs were drafted and sold. So it shows you that there's not a big risk, not a big urgency to drench lambs between marking and weaning. There was a little difference in six or seven of those up to two kilos. Two kilos was the maximum difference that we got over that 10 to 12 weeks. And in one or one mob, the untreated lambs were heavier. So what that means, I'm not sure. Overall, the weights were virtually identical. Right, so lambs that got drenched monthly from, from marking to weaning put on 16.6 .6 kilos. Lambs that didn't get drenched at all between marking and weaning put on about 16.6 .6 kilos as well over that time. And these egg counts typically were up to about 200 eggs per gram, occasionally up to three or 400 eggs per gram on one farm. Um, we had another farm with barber's pole worm where the egg counts were higher, six or 700 eggs per gram, but again the effects were similar. So not a huge burden of worms in the lambs, and I mean they're only young lambs, um, but if you've got that under control and you've got good nutrition and you've got ewes in good condition, um, then there's not a lot of point in drenching lambs between marking and weaning. 
and there's some of our, our finished lambs um, ready to go on a couple of the spots. All right, last, we've got a couple of minutes. Last two minutes. two minutes. Right, this is the final point that we wanted to make. This is the drench efficacy data. So we did resistance tests on most of those farms, on six of those nine farms um, in southern, southwestern New South Wales. In an ideal world, all of those numbers should be 100. Right, so if we didn't have drench resistance, all of those numbers, so we've got ivermectin here, moxidectin here, some combination drenches, and a few other bits and pieces that we tried, they should be 100. So the data is, is in the paper, the numbers are in the paper if you want to have a closer look at it. The message from that is that drench resistance is relatively common and relatively widespread, um, and relatively severe on some farms in southwestern New South Wales, and so you need to know your status if you're planning treatments. Um, there is some quite bad, when I came to New South Wales they all laughed at me because WA was the worst for drench resistance. Um, that was only because they hadn't looked here. Um, ever since I've been here we've managed to find it as bad or if not worse than WA. Alright, so key messages. So this is the, 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 the summary that we've got so far. Um, I've just put that proviso up there in that if you've got barber's pole worm on your farm then you probably need to just monitor it a little bit more closely. We got away with it in these years but if it's a bad barber's pole year there might be some issues. The first message is that prime lamb U worm control, so worms in prime lamb uses a balance between condition score, nutrition and worm challenge. Right? If the ewes are in good condition and there's good nutrition in front of them so they're not going backwards then they're very resilient, quite resilient to worm effects. So they still get worms, they still get some worm egg counts, they still get some worms inside them, but the effects of those worms are not to the point where you need to treat them excessively. Right? They can manage the worms relatively well on their own. What we would suggest is an effective broad spectrum pre-lambing treatment for the ewes, and that's from that group that we left untreated. Right? We saw, even despite good nutrition and good condition, low worm challenge that you can lose weight in ewes quite significantly in some years if you don't treat them. So the best time to put that routine treatment in is pre-lambing. The proviso on that is you must know that it's effective. Right? There's no point. We saw with the resistance data that we had um, that resistance is present. You need to know that that's an effective treatment. For the lambs, as long as they're growing well and probably the best indication of the lamb the effects of the worms on the lambs is the growth rate. All of ours were sort of 230 up to 300 plus grams per head per day in that time between marking and first sale. If they're doing that, the ewes are in good condition, then there's no point, there was relatively little point in giving a drench to the lambs in that time. And then our egg counts are the way to manage that. Um, we probably found that, that some farmers, the nil treatment farmers, didn't drench their prime lamb ewes and lambs enough. A lot of other farmers overdrenched their prime lamb ewes and lambs. And so if you, you run these basic treatments in, the rest of the time keep an eye on nutrition, keep an eye on growth rates, keep an eye on the season, the food that's in front of them, the condition score of the ewes, and then occasionally some egg counts, then you'll be able to manage it um, and plan occasionally other treatments such as summer autumn drenches, but certainly that will also stop you from overdrenching, overtrading those, those ewes and lambs. All right, we might leave it there. Just a quick thank you to the farmers. I said we had nine farmers. Um, we also had an industry advisory group that included the LLS, some of the resellers and vets around town and consultants that was helping us drive this. Said so Cole Scribner set it up as, as we were going. Student helpers and Bruce has told me that um, the checks in the mail, Charlie. Charlie's son, Bruce, did a fair bit of work here with this project as well, and I'm sure Bruce paid you very well for that. Um, and also, as I said, MLA, Meat and Livestock Australia, funded the whole project nationally, so we... Um, we thank them for that as well. Okay, any questions?